but yeah, we're I guess we're, we're first generation graduates. Um, I think it's important not to be put off because of your background or because of where you come from. Um, I think what you can achieve is bounded by your ambition. So be ambitious, go for it. The worst thing you can do is get rejected. I did that. So that's a little bit, but it's not that bad. You get over it. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's, it's undoubtedly worth a go. everyone, welcome to the Oxford and Cambridge Project, the podcast that aims to make Oxford accessible by lifting the veil on the secrets of two of the most prestigious universities in the world. I'm Aubertune Simon. And I'm Cleopatra Caprianu. And today we have Nick Rogers with us. Um, Nick is currently a head of engineering at a fintech startup based in London. He graduated from Churchill College in 2016 with a first class degree in computer science. Nick grew up in Ipswich in England and originally applied to Cambridge to study natural sciences. After getting rejected by the university in 2012, he took a gap year and gained work experience as a software engineer with the aim to reapply to Cambridge the next year. He did so and received an unconditional offer from Churchill College. His activities during uh, university included rowing, being a casino croupier at Mabel's and becoming a dissertation supervisor for a fellow student. Hi, Nick. Hey, Beth. Good to be here. Great. Great to Good have to you have on here. You. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an exciting story, Nick. I'm looking forward to hearing the details of it. I think maybe if you tell us what you studied at Cambridge and uh, why you decided to study that. So I applied for natural sciences, physical natural sciences. Um, I ultimately graduated um, in computer science, so I changed tripods at the end of the first year. Um, why did I study? <laughs> why did I apply for that, I guess is the question. Um, I was always interested in like physics or maths or computer science. Um, there's lots and lots of universities that teach physics really well. There's fewer universities, certainly back in 2012, that taught computer science really well. Um, you obviously don't know in advance whether you're going to get into a university right at the top of the rankings or whether you get into one lower down, especially you know, just at the end of AS. Um, and so you sort of have to hedge your bets. And so that, that was part of the reason that physics was more attractive at the time. But then obviously once I was at Cambridge, um, in first year I did a chemistry module, a physics module, a maths module, and a computer science module. Um, and I found the computer science module really easy, and I did really well on it, and I found chemistry particularly horrible. Um, <laughs> and so it, it made quite a lot of sense to, to look at switching into computer science at the end of the first year. So you decided to change um, and you actually joined the second year of computer science, right? You didn't have to retake. No, nope. yeah, you just, so the computer science first year and the physical natural sciences first year are very similar. Um, in Komsky, you do two computer science modules, a maths module from that from the Natsuki course um, and one of the Natsuki modules. In natural sciences, you do um, two natural sciences modules from the Natsuki course, the same maths module and the same one of the same computer science modules. Um, and so there's, you only basically miss out on one of the modules from the first year, and so you don't actually have to redo the first year, you just go straight to Comsky year two. Um, was that a relatively easy transition then, in terms of the logistics as well, or is it quite hard to move courses? So in theory, the you need your director of studies, I think, of the subject you're departing to sign off on it. You need the director of studies for the subject you're joining to sign off on it. You need the senior tutor of the college to sign off on it. And in theory, you need at least a 2-1 grade um, to do so, although in practice that's waived in quite a few cases, I believe. Right, okay. So you feel like you made the right decision switching to, to Komsky then? Yeah, I mean, um, I got a first, so I turned out okay in the end. <laughs> but Good. did you get a first because you worked really hard on it, or mostly you just enjoyed it, so the hard work was easy? I think it's, it's definitely hard work getting a first um, either way, but it's certainly easy if you enjoy the subject. I did enjoy physics, but physics always felt like harder work to me than playing around with computers and looking at the theory behind them. Great, so I guess like just from this information, it'd be great to know more a bit about your background in um, high school. What made you apply to Cambridge, just on the run-up? So, um, at A-level I did maths, physics, further maths and chemistry. Um, and I got A-stars on all of them a long time ago. Um, <laughs> my sister was two years older than me, so she was two years ahead of me. Um, and she got an offer from Cambridge in 2010. 
um, and everyone was going around saying how smart she was. Um, so I obviously had to prove them uh, not wrong, but that I was equally capable. <laughs> um, and that gave me a lot of motivation to a aim good old for sibling rivalry. I, of course, then ultimately got rejected from Cambridge in 2012. So that was um, didn't really prove the point. <laughs> no, <laughs> missed that make. one, but um, I got there in the end. And do you want to talk a bit more about that? How? What was the process? Yeah, so I went for some university open days, I guess, back in 2011, 2012, whenever it would have been. Um, and I went to Downing College, amongst other colleges. But Downing stood out to me at the time as um, a really nice college. Um, you know, the classic Cambridge quads. and Yeah, Downing's nice so pretty. And, that kind of thing. Um, and so there was a lot of message at the time that all Cambridge colleges are the same, so don't really worry about it. So I thought on that basis, I like the look of this one, I despise this one. I didn't really do much more research than that. I think that was a mistake in retrospect. I would very much encourage people to look quite in detail at the college they're applying to and work out what they want yeah. because colleges are not the same. It can be quite strategic, isn't it? Yeah. How, how you apply and where you apply. Definitely. And this is why we're doing this podcast. So it's great that you're saying that. Um, and so can you talk about your interview at Downing? And... Yeah, so, so I applied um, again for physical and natural sciences at Downing. The interview process on the day was um, two in-person interviews with two different pairs of people. There's one in the morning about 10 o'clock. In between the two interviews there's a maths exam for about 90 minutes. So I think I did the interview about 10, um, it, sorry, in the morning. Um, I then did the, I think I went to prep for lunch about midday, <laughs> then came back for a maths exam about 1, I think that ran till about 2.30 and I had another interview at 2.30 on the dot. So I basically had to run from the maths exam to the interview. Good um, memory. Yeah. I, I, knew, I knew upon walking out of that interview that I was definitely not going to get into Downing College because the interview went pretty awfully. Right. But I also knew from the rules that I was guaranteed to be pulled. Um, so I was guaranteed to have a chance that other colleges might fish me from the pool um, and potentially either re-interview me or admit me. That's interesting. How do you, how do you know you were going to pu- get pulled? So at the time, and it's probably changed now because AS levels no longer exist or AS exams no longer exist. Um, at the time, if you had a, at least a 93% average in your AS, UMS, you were guaranteed to be pulled regardless of how poor you did in the interview. I gather the cover sheet they use um, for essentially your file in the pool has a big box on that says you're scoring the interview out of 10. Yeah. I imagine mine was a 1, so it probably wasn't a particularly compelling file to look at. Um, Why did it go so badly? Was it you know, just a typical Cambridge interview that everybody's scared of? Or? I, I think the first one, so you know, my very first Cambridge interview, the first one in the morning went pretty well. Um, it threw me a little bit going straight from the maths exam to the second interview, especially because the exam essentially finished late and I was effectively late to the interview, but fortunately my interviewers were later than I was. <laughs> um, the interview itself, I don't think at the time, or I didn't think at the time, was particularly fair. Um, my view on that hasn't particularly changed. Um, I, I found my experience at Churchill College to be a much, much better experience. Your experience interviewing? Yeah, my experience interviewing. Yeah, that's fine. I guess like I feel like the majority of people that I've spoken to about their interviews just actually hated the experience or yeah. I, I don't agree like well for me um, it was really smooth and I was kind of like oh I, I think I think I'm okay I think I'm gonna get it and, but yeah I guess it can either go either way where you think it went horribly and then you actually got in whereas when you know it went horribly and then you just move on with life <laughs> yeah I, I, I had no shadow that so I had no shadow of a doubt coming out of the interview that I wasn't going to get knocked from Downing. I knew I was going to get pulled, so sure enough, I would have told I think the 4th of January, uh, which is when you get the um, letter back from the original college you applied to to let you know your status, and they said I've been pulled, which was yeah. unsurprising. You then have this experience of sort of sitting in the pool um, whilst this pooling process goes on. Um, We've all been through it. And then you have, you <laughs> the have three this, of us in this room. Yeah. <laughs> so you sort of have this metaphor of essentially drowning in the pool, which is where you just sit there days go by, your probability of getting fish obviously decreases pretty quickly as the days go by. Yeah. And so after about three weeks, you still haven't heard anything, but you know at that point you're pretty much going to get a rejection letter at some point. And then sure enough, that arrived in the post that we got for that. What did you decide to do after you got your rejection? What did you do for that year? Yeah. So I had a, um, I had a, an offer from Imperial College, which was, I think, probably A-star AA or something. Um, I then went on in the summer to achieve a star, A star, A star, A star. Not that I was trying to prove a point. <laughs> um, I then I got a summer job um, working as a software engineer, um, which was lucky. And then they were very keen for me to stay on for the entire year, so they offered me a substantial pay rise to essentially defer my Imperial College place and stay on for the year, which I then decided to do. So I called up Imperial and said, would you mind if I started essentially 2013 rather than 2012? They said, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, and I basically had the year to myself. 
Um, my dad then suggested, well, you know, maybe you could reapply to, to Cambridge and get another shot. Um, to which I said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how Imperial will feel about that. It seems a little bit cheeky. Um, <laughs> so I think we ultimately contacted the um, sort of head of physics at Imperial and said, oh, would you, you know, effectively, just being straight up, would you mind if I... Because you, you have to relinquish your offer to Imperial and then reapply to Imperial and hope they give you another offer, even though you've essentially rejected them uh, the first time around. Right. Um, so I said, you know, would you mind if I essentially relinquish my offer, reapply to you again, because I want to have another go at going to Cambridge, will, will you still take me next year? And he said, yep, sure, we'll still take you, we won't even ask to interview you again, we'll just give you another offer. Nice. Um, Very so nice Imperial College, <laughs> so I lost so I, that on that one. I essentially had an opportunity to have a free shot of reapplying it. You know, I was already taking the year off, I already had an offer to Imperial. In theory, as long as Imperial stopped their word, I had nothing to lose by reapplying, so it was a no-brainer. Okay, so after that discussion with your dad, you basically decided to reapply to Cambridge. And um, can you tell us how you chose the college the second time round and how that process was? Yeah, so um, I knew I was going to reapply for natural, sorry, physical natural sciences again. Um, so it's the same course. I then decided to be a bit more methodical about which college to apply for. Um, Bearing in mind that I sort of learned in the interim that they're not all the same, they are very different, they even have different interview procedures on the day, different testing procedures. Um, so I had a look and I decided that because of you know the stress of the interview and that kind of stuff, there's nothing going on the day, that I didn't think I would perform well relative to the rest of the class on on-the-day examinations. So I looked at a college which wouldn't have any on-the-day examinations, so no TSA, Cheeky. no mass test. Um, that restricted down to a set of, I think, like eight or nine colleges of which Churchill College was one. Um, I then looked... Um, for the past three years, admission statistics of those eight or nine colleges and looked at the number of applicants to each college for natural sciences versus the number of offers and found that Churchill College had the highest offer rate, which I think was about 40%. Um, so on that basis, um, I looked a bit more at Churchill College itself, just to sort of sanity check it. It was very close to the West Cambridge site, which is where the physics lab was. Um, mm -hmm. It had nice big greens, um, it had a nice big student intake, it specialised in um, STEM, and so it made a lot of sense. So on that basis, I, I applied to Church College the second time around. Nice. So you sort of used an elimination process, I guess, where you went through your criteria that you had in mind and then sort of eliminated college. Eff where... Effectively, although it's, it's, it's worth saying that, you know, although I sort of rank ordered them by offer rate to work out which one in principle had the highest raw chance of success, I then redid that analysis for my intake and realised that Churchill had a massive surge in applicants that year, the same year that I replied, and actually their offer rate dropped by like a factor of two. Yeah, and so say, it like wasn't the most sound is, statistical analysis. Every year is so different, right? So you can't actually really base it on, exactly, yeah, on that offer rate. Right? Yeah. People always try to be a bit strategic and smart about it, but it doesn't always turn out the way you think it will. <laughs> um, but in any case, people do say that whatever college you go to at, at Oxbridge, you end up liking it. So. Um, but yeah, I, th I think if you if you feel like you test very well and you feel like you know you don't feel stress or pressure then by all means go to a, a college where you'll do an exam and then you'll probably outshine everybody else. If you feel like um, that sort of thing doesn't suit you very well, then, then aim for something else. Although that said, I think now that A-level exams have gone away, I think a lot of colleges, slash almost all colleges, have an on-the-day test because they try and make up for that lack of data from the, the AS exams. And so that's something that might not be possible anymore. Yeah, uh, I had a test as well on the day. I don't know about you, Rob. Um, I also kind of... Not knowing anything about the colleges, I noted that the college where I uh, interviewed didn't have a test. So I thought, like, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I <laughs> saw that that was a bonus for me. Yeah, for sure. I was jet lagged and flying from Singapore, so it definitely wouldn't have been a good thing for me to have a written test either. Um, so do you remember anything about your interview, your actual interview at Churchill? Yeah, so I, I arrived on the day, I think it was around the 4th of December. Um, so it's like a relatively cold winter's day. Um, I'm only about an hour's drive from, from Cambridge, where I grew up. Um, so it was uh, an hour's drive there. I got to Church College for the very first time. I hadn't actually seen it in person before. Um, but it was lovely, um, especially sort of in the winter. It just, you know, it seemed, I don't know, it seemed to work. <laughs> I don't think all students would agree with that, but I, I get your point. So then we um, went up, you, you sort of go in, you have to bring your exam certificates with you to sort of uh, prove what you said in the application form was correct. Um, you sort of register, say you're there, you then sit in the room, they take copies of your certificates, and then a, a guide comes along to guide you to your interview room um, on your interview slot. Um, I think I just had the one interview for Churchill, 
Um, so it, it really isn't that long. So you're sort of there for an hour, and then you go on, and that's your that's your shot of getting into Cambridge. Um, so I went in. I think it was I was interviewed by the director of studies for physics, um, and I was interviewed by the director of studies for geology, um, despite the fact that I wasn't applying for geology and I knew nothing about geology. Right. Were there like tricky questions, like the ones you sort of read about? Or... Yeah, so, so the actual interview structure, the interview's only about an hour. Um, again, there's these two directors of studies with PhDs, phenomenally smart people who are sitting there interviewing you. Um, they start you off sort of trying to warm you up. So it, it, it felt immediately very different to the Downing experience that I had. Um, it was much more friendly. They weren't trying to stress you out. Um, they were trying to just get you warmed up and try and get you flowing, trying to get the fairest possible evaluation of you. Um, yeah. Because ultimately they wanted to take the best people they could. Um, it felt quite meritocratic. So they start you with a, a warm-up question, um, or they start you with a set of warm-up questions, um, which are really simple, and it's not designed to really evaluate you, but it's just designed to get you talking, get you thinking. So the very first thing they ask was, can you differentiate x cubed, which is obviously not hard for anyone that's done A-level maths. Um, there, there was a few differentiation type questions, again, it was just, it wasn't designed to evaluate you, I'm sure everyone does reasonably well at them, or, or you know, even if they don't, because they're just getting a bit of nerves at the beginning, they don't really evaluate that. Yeah. Once, once you're then flowing, um, then moved over to some physics questions. I think there was a question about, sort of like a mechanics type question about dropping a ball on a slope and how it would accelerate and decelerate as it goes down the slope and then back up the slope. Um, and that, that went reasonably well. Um, then it switched from the director of studies for physics asking the questions to the director of studies for geology. And I was sort of like, okay, what, what's going to happen here? Because I'm, I'm not applying for geology. I've never been that interested in geology. I don't really know anything about geology. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's this rock on the table and she, was, um, she asked me, like, okay, can you talk about the rock? So I, um, I sort of picked up this rock and was like, oh, you know, it feels sandy. Um, so, okay, can you tell me what type of rock it is? And I was like, well, sandstone? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, it's sandstone. Like, okay, so far so good. Um, and then it was sort of just, I think it was taking you to a domain you knew nothing about, um, giving you something, you know, give, giving you something that you could evaluate and then just seeing how your brain worked with that and seeing as, as they prompted you, um, how you'd react to those prompts, how you could incorporate knowledge that they were giving you into your sort of mental model of, of what was going on and give answers that reflected that. I, mean, I, th I think what they try and do in an interview is trying to proxy um, how you would behave in a supervision because the supervision is very similar where you know you do this work in advance of the supervision you get it marked before the supervision you get it given to you and then they'll say like this you know this bit you basically didn't understand so let's talk through it yeah and then they try and say okay t talk about what your current model is in your head and you can talk through it and they say okay well that bit you just said there is not quite right it actually works like this you need to take what they've said incorporate it into your mental model see how that changes your understanding and then talk about that and so it's it's a very similar process to the interview where they're basically trying to drip feed you knowledge and seeing how that changes changes your opinion, changes your model, changes what you think. Yeah, I think that's right. I think they are just trying to sort of assess your way of thinking and how you react when there's um, new information coming in or when your opinion of something is, is challenged. So they don't necessarily expect 100% the correct answer, but they just want to see the process of how you would get there. So how did you feel when leaving that, that interview at Churchill? Yeah, so I, I felt much more positive than the Downing experience. Um, I felt like I had a good shot. I think it went reasonably well. I didn't think I'd nailed every question by any means, but I felt like I gave as good a representation of myself as I could have. Yeah. And so I felt like it was reasonable. Um, you didn't go away, you wait over Christmas again, you, you get the uh, letter on the 4th of, so sorry, the 4th of January, I think it is. Um, and this time around, I got uh, an offer of admission um, from Churchill College, which was um, very nice. Excellent. Congrats. <laughs> was there ever a debate in your mind whether you would go to Imperial or Cambridge, or was it...? Well, so this is, this is a funny thing. Imperial didn't actually give me an offer until May, um, so it's good that I got off, got off from Cambridge, because I actually only applied to Imperial and Cambridge the second time around. I applied to nothing else. And so Imperial, if I had failed to get into Cambridge, and Imperial didn't essentially do what they said they were going to do, then I would have had no offers from anywhere and I would have had to go through a th uh, another reapplication process. So oh my God. Yeah, in, hindsight, <laughs> in hindsight, you should at least add some extra ones because you might as well. Um, <laughs> Just to be safe. But yeah, essentially there was, um, you know, there was... I, you know, I, I very much wanted to just emulate my sister, I think, at that point, so there's never really any thought about going to Imperial. Um, not that Imperial is, by any means, not a, a fantastic quality university. Yeah, of course. Um, what a very smart family. Oh, some of us. <laughs> Runs in the family. Uh, right, so I guess you got into Churchill, you started studying Natsuki, you switched to Komsky in second year. Could you tell us a bit more about Komsky and how it's taught at Cambridge and what the structure of the course is? Um... Yeah, so 
um, again, the so in the first year of Komsky, um, you basically sort of share a lot of course with the Natskis, um, and then it sort of forks off at the end of the first year. Um, the I imagine it's pretty similar to other subjects, although I'm not that knowledgeable about other subjects. Um, but essentially, there's it's obviously split into three terms. There's a number of courses that are lectured over each term. Um, in second year, you don't have a lot of choice. I don't think about what modules you do, and you don't have that much choice in third year either. Um, but you generally sort of every module is examined in the exam, but you only have to answer say five of the ten questions. And so, although you should do every course and you should do every supervisions for every course, you then have optionality in the exam about which courses you actually decide to answer, and that way you effectively pick your top five courses. Um, to get the strongest mark. Or if you're particularly masochistic, you can pick your worst five courses and make your life harder. <laughs> um, so per per term, there's lectures. Um, there's lectures for natural sciences in the first year, Monday through Saturday, six days a week for the eight week terms. Um, in second year, that drops down to, I think, just five days a week, um, Monday to Friday. Um, there's typically a couple per day. Um, I think as you go into third year, the schedule becomes a bit more variant, but it's, it's typically sort of nine to eleven ish um, for the lectures, and then. On the back of each of those modules, you do a supervision sort of per module per week, um, and that requires sort of four to six hours of work per module. So you're doing, you know, 15 hours of lecture, something like that, plus another 30 hours of supervision work, plus another four or five hours of supervision themselves um, every week. So you're, you're doing about 40 to 50 hours a week of work every week for, for those eight or nine week periods. Yeah. And um, I assume because Churchill is quite... Um like STEM focused college, did you have supervisions in college with like your own supervisors or was it more university wide? Yeah, so there's a there's a table at, at Cambridge, not the Tompkins table, um, another table that's not published um, publicly that shows the ranking of um, sort of college course combinations. So the most, you know, the most likely to, um, Successful. course college to get a first comes first in the table and then the second one and so on. So you can see right. that. Trinity at Mass has the highest um, proportion of first, and so that comes first in that table. But the second result on that table, at least when I started, was Churchill College Computer Science. Um, so computer science was taught especially well at um, Churchill College, um, and that's because of the director studies there. Um, <laughs> we'll have to set up for success. Yeah, we'll have to look for that table. <laughs> it's, it's not public, I don't think, because they, um, they don't publish the statistics that easily. But, um, but it's, it's published internally to the director of studies internally, so they can see effectively how they've done. All right. Um, the director of studies for Churchill College is also the director of studies for a number of other colleges for computer science because he's that good. So I think he did Sydney Sussex as well and a couple of others. Um, but I think Churchill College got the best quality. Um, it, that was his primary college. Um, and so we, we had a fantastic quality. Um, so we often had supervisions with him. Um, he did a phenomenal amount of supervisions a week, something like 70 hours of supervisions a week. Um, and didn't you have also like lecturers that were quite... Um you know, famous in the computer science field. Yeah, so you had, um, I'm not going to remember their names now, but, you know, one of the great things about Cambridge is that you have people who have made genuine contributions to the state of their subject that then come and lecture you. Sometimes those people aren't actually great at lecturing. Um, other, other times they are. <laughs> you, you get someone extremely knowledgeable and extremely passionate and can really get knowledge across to you. Um, and those, those sorts of lectures are really, really enjoyable. Um, other times they're still really, really knowledgeable. They're still often quite passionate. They're not necessarily always the best um, lecturer, but they still have great course materials and you have great supervisions. Um, so it really is a phenomenal learning experience. Studying Komsky at Cambridge, is that quite uh, theoretical or is it more practical? Are you, what are the assessments like? Is it all like handwritten or are you writing code on your computer? Is it just coding? <laughs> is it, what yes. is computer science? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Often people go into computer science as sort of a feeder subject to get a career as a software engineer, um, which is particularly in vogue at the moment, thanks to big tech. Um, computer science is very different to software engineering. Um, software engineering is a bit more practical and pragmatic. Computer science is much more theoretical um, and also very broad. So you look at th everything from sort of computer architectures, how to build a CPU, to um, compiler optimization. Um, how to compile languages and, and create the most efficient um, assembly code possible um, to artificial intelligence, computer vision, um, even things like e-commerce. So it's, it's a very broad subject, but it is generally very theoretical. There are a few classes. Um, so you do at some point do a, 
a Java module, but the Java module is about essentially a four week course in a three year degree. So it really isn't focused on programming. There's actually very, very little programming. You can go there having never programmed before, that's okay. Um, but you, you likely need a very good grounding in mathematics because it really is a very mathematical degree. And if you're good at maths, you can, your, your, your capabilities will translate very well into computer science. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about what characteristics and requirements there are. Uh, what do you think a student thinking of applying for a Komsky should know beforehand? So I think you have to be, I, I wouldn't necessarily worry about not having written that much code, but if you've, mm -hmm. if you've never really been curious about how a computer works, you're probably not a great fit. I think you have to have some natural curiosity for how a computer works to do computer science. Did you have that? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I started, I made my first website at the age of nine. I started doing professional work in exchange for money from the age of 11. Um, <laughs> well, on, your, I, on your parents' account? or <laughs> No, I just, you know, it was the internet in those days, right? When it would have been 2004-ish. Um, you could work remotely and people didn't know how old you were and people never asked. So. <laughs> um, then I, I actually um, had a share of a small business that we started and I sold that. I think that was when I was 14. I think we sold that share when I was 16. We sold a second business as well um, about 16, 17. Right. At the same time, not for substantial sums of money, um, but just you know little bits. So I was always very interested in programming. I worked in the gap years as a programmer. Um, so by the time I came to to to, ch uh, to church, or I'd written three or four different languages professionally. But again, programming is very different from computer science. There was still a lot of stuff in computer science that I knew nothing about going into it. Um, but it's it's all really related, and and that was a, a really great opportunity to to learn about it and also gain a really, really solid foundation, you know, the fundamentals that underpin the actual languages that you use sort of day to day. That's really interesting. And what was your favourite part of your course, would you say? Or maybe the worst part? My, my favourite part of my course? Um, I actually really enjoyed the, so in the, in the second year we did a C++ course, um, which just filled in some of the gaps that I'd sort of missed when I was just learning C++ casually myself. Um, so actually that was that was one of the ones that gave me sort of the most like aha moments, like, you know, oh, this is how this all works. And you suddenly just clicks together, and like, okay, I sort of get it now. Um, whereas before you, you sort of plod along and sometimes things confuse you and it, you know, you don't necessarily know all the details. Um, but there are other, you know, I, I particularly enjoyed the computer vision course, I enjoyed the AI course, um, I did my dissertation on, on AI. Um, what was the worst part of, of the course um, is an interesting question. I think this, this is not the worst part, but we, Cambridge is keen, I think, sort of on day one to teach you that computer science is not all about programming. And so the first thing they teach you is functional programming. And a lot of people have done imperative programming, which is a different programming style. You know, they've done things like Java and JavaScript and C Sharp and Python and whatever. Um, functional programming is very different. And so suddenly you have this big paradigm shift on day one where, you know, you might come in as a smart ass who thinks you know everything, having done three or four languages. And you get presented with functional programming, which makes no sense whatsoever. You don't really understand why they're teaching it to you and you don't really understand why it's useful. Um, and it sort of continues on from there for the next three years, really. Um, but you, you learn why it's useful, you learn why it's different, um, and, it, and it really sort of broadens your mindset. So it's, it's not to say it's the worst thing, but just on day one when I was sort of looking at it, I was just like, you know, it's just, uh, there's a bit of an impedance mismatch. Yeah. Yeah, it can be intimidating to look at the curriculum sometimes, or the reading lists, or you know all the, all this new material. But um, yeah, I think everybody's going through the the same thing. So definitely. And so just bouncing off of Cleo's previous question, how um, do the assessments go? How do the supervisions go? Do you all just bring a laptop during exams? Do you have access to a laptop? Um, or yeah, how is do... it essays? Or... Yeah, so it's it's mostly an essay based subject. You don't do your computer so you don't do your computer science exams on a laptop. Um, you do it on pen and paper. Right. Um, <laughs> you don't generally bring a laptop to your supervisions. You submit work in advance, typically in PDF form, um, typically written in LaTeX. If people are familiar with that, it's effectively a typesetting um, software, right? Yeah, language software. Um, it's sort of like Word, but you have a bit more control over what happens. Um, so you submit that, you get it marked, you get the paper back, and you generally just talk through the paper. It's it's not about doing work in the supervision, it's about talking through the concepts and building and understanding your head, so you don't really need a laptop to do that. Um, you don't really need a laptop in lectures either, unless you want to use it to take notes. Um, it's mostly about building and understanding in your mind, it's not about doing a thing. Um, there are a few labs though, so there's labs where you do a bit of... Um, 
sort of uh, fairy log, I think it's called. Um, there's also labs where you have to do a bit of programming. So there's labs where we, we had like a group project in second year where you essentially make like a web app type thing and at that point you you know you do your laptop. Um, in the exams, um, you know, so you, we do courses on Java and you, you do courses on like C++ and you then have an exam question on C++ or Java and you actually have to write code with pen and paper to answer the question. Nice which and traditional. <laughs> is, you know, is, is a thing that you can do. Um, it's obviously not how you choose to do it, um, but it's, it's fine. Um, that's it if you, if you have a learning disability or something like that where you've got an impeded ability to, to write or to read like dyslexia, then you are allowed to use a computer in that case. Right. So you were obviously quite successful uh, in your course. So I was wondering if there's anything you did that helped you academically or any sort of tips and advice you have for people, how to structure their studying or... Yeah, history is written by the victors. I was certainly very successful towards the end of my course. I'm not sure I necessarily started like that. Um, <laughs> well, you definitely started with another course, so... <laughs> yeah. To um, begin with. Any tips? I guess you have to be very regimented in your, your eight or nine weeks while you're there. It's, it's sort of both a marathon and a sprint. Um, you, you're there for eight weeks and then you stop at the end and you can relax and you can sort of regain your sleep there and you can start feeling like a normal person again and then you go again for another eight weeks. It's very intense. But because it's very finite, um, it's it's relatively easy to focus. You know, it's what uh, eight times seven days, fifty six days per term. You, know, you basically just start. And you can't count the days until you're done, and then you go again. Um, you you need to put in the hours. There's no substitute for putting the hours. Um, a lot of people, especially in first year, don't necessarily fairly represent how much time they're doing. You know, a lot of people saying they're barely working and they'll be doing twelve hour days. That's I think that's a really British thing because. When, in my course, I always thought I was very honest with the little hours I was doing revising in first year. And then people would, like, try to one-up me by going down and saying even less hours. But they were obviously fronting it all, like, it was all a lie because I was literally not putting in the hours. And they were, but they were just saying, like, I don't know, this very British thing of just, um saying like, oh, I'm not doing anything. Being very humble, but in a sort of yeah, so, so braggy I sort of, way. <laughs> I, I sort of naively believed people in, in first year and sort of emulated them and, and then realised that wasn't necessarily the most successful strategy. Um, by about third year, I got the hang of it. And you, you do need to do sort of your 50 hours a week if you want to be successful. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you learn by the end um, sort of a a strategy for how you're going to spend your time. So, you know, waking up consistently at the same time, having a consistent morning routine, cracking on with work for, say, three or four hours in the morning, having lunch for an hour, cracking on with work for four hours, you know. It's not the same as you do in a normal work day when you're a professional. Um, but, you, you know, it is it is harder when you are by yourself. You have no boss. There is no one looking over you. You need to be your own boss. You need to set that that schedule and you need to stick to it um, day in, day out for 56 days at a time. Um, and then you can take those, those breaks. But it's, it's, it's sort of similar to work life but also different to work life because there's no intrinsic day-to-day -day pressure there's just this sort of big spectre at the end of each year of these exams that you have to perform in through like a five-day period um but you you have to do the work day in day out nine months before in order to be well that you can't just cram the last minute like you can for a level definitely yeah you do need to be consistent yeah um, consistency is the key but and so when you were taking breaks and you know kind of relaxing what what would you do um if you ever relaxed <laughs> Yeah, um, so I did rowing. Um, I, I briefly did rugby for about one and a half games before I broke my collarbone in the <laughs> second game in like the, the third week of the first term of the first year, um, which could take out my rugby career. How fun was having a broken collarbone during first year? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still went skiing five weeks later with a still broken collarbone. <laughs> we do not um, condone this behaviour. <laughs> which was not the brightest idea I ever had. Um, but, it, you know, it, it was fine. It's, you're so sort of lost as a fresher that it doesn't even make a difference if all your bones are still together by the end of the term, frankly. Um, but you, yeah, so, um, you know, you go to the gym, you can do rowing, there's lots of societies. Um, rowing was great fun. Um, some of the time. <laughs> some, of the, some of the time it's sort of like 6am in winter and it's dark and there's ice on the river and you're rowing and you can't really feel your fingers. Um, but other times it's, you know, it's, that's sort of like perfect weather and it's, it's a really nice day out with your team. Um, so you rowed with college? Yeah, so I rode in M5, M4, M3, M2, and M1, which is, it's, um, there's, there's 
W1 for the women's first team for the college, and one for the men's first team, and then there's a men's second team and a men's third team. So I rode in every single one of the men's teams um, in my, my rowing career. I'm guessing Certainly. you were progressing. Yeah, as time went. Yeah. <laughs> um, I basically went up, and then um, I think I sort of, by, by third year when I really wanted to focus on my academics, I sort of quit. And I think I I got maybe roped into doing a bit of rowing at the end of the year, and like M2 or M3 again. But, uh, yeah, because yeah. M1, I guess, like is more of a commitment than yeah, M2. Yeah, M1 is very intense. You have to do... You, know, you, you they basically have you have a trainer that you pay for right um that the team pays for they make you do you know ergs a certain amount of time per week you have uh, potentially weight measurements depending on how competitive the college is trying to be um you might have four outings per week at 6 a.m before your lectures um so it does you know if you want to says you know as, as ever, if you, you want to compete at the, at the top of the league and be, and be the best you can be you have to work hard for it there's no substitute for that um but there's you know there's all these teams where you can sort of bite off how much you want to you want to chew if you want to just do a bit of casual rowing you can join an m4 um and you know it's it's fairly easy um if you want to really subject yourself to, to punishment you can try and do m1 for a little while <laughs> had you done any rowing before um no i never rowed before cambridge so um, you, you can be a complete beginner and still yeah no, that's great and they, they actually start with especially in first year i didn't actually row in first year first term but they start with um what they call the nm and nw boats nm1 nm2 nm nw1 nw2 and they're the novice men and novice women's boats so they start right. off for people that have never rowed before. Yeah. But even if you miss that, which is what I did, um, I started in the third year, you, you, know, you can get roped in. There's, yeah, there's, there's just, you know, so many, so many boats and so many people happy to coach that oh, it's not a problem. Definitely. Makes sense. Um, maybe that leads well into college life. So do you want to tell us a bit more about Churchill and maybe an insider perspective and sort of an outsider perspective as well? Like, how does the rest of the university view Churchill what are the stereotypes yeah. I guess like the first question would maybe be how would you describe Ch Ch Churchill College to someone who's like never been to Cambridge in like a sentence or just a couple of sentences so uh, I think Churchill this is going to test my history but I think Churchill College was founded by um, a guy called Winston Churchill um, <laughs> not, not, not very well known um, he wanted it to compete with or he wanted a, a British university that would compete with MIT in the US um, but then I think sort of looked at the practicalities of that and it turned out that the, the most effective way to do that was to start a Cambridge College rather than start a whole new university. Right. Um, I think in the 60s, Cambridge College, sorry, in the 60s, Churchill College opened um, and made its first people, but because of because it had sort of a mandate to try and compete with MIT, it had a mandate to have 70% of people doing sciences or STEM type subjects and 30% arts, whereas other colleges don't have any such mandate. So it was always more science focused. Um, I never knew that. That's quite interesting. Yeah. And I guess, like, in terms of architecture, church is a bit different, so, like... Yeah, so it was, it was built in the 60s. Um, and as people know from 60s buildings, concrete was in vogue then. Um, that said, I think Churchill College is one of the better-looking 60s colleges. There are others, I'm not naming names. Um, <laughs> that, I don't know what college you're talking about. I, I feel think, attacked. <laughs> I, I, think look, I think look worse. And, you know, even St John's, I think, has a, an accommodation block that they foolishly built in the 60s when... Yeah, Vogue, which is not the most attractive. Well, actually, but, there's um, an interesting story behind those new buildings in old colleges, but we'll come to that but, in but a later episode. <laughs> a lot of colleges have um, sort of playing fields that are disjoint from the college because the college might be in the centre of town; and they have a playing field out of town. Churchill is a slightly more out of town college. Um, you know, it's like a whole five minute bike ride from the centre, um, but it's very lucky in that it's um, it's basically got its placing playing fields right next to it. Um, it's, it's one vast expanse. Yeah, oh, Churchill um, fields are just huge. You feel like you can just run and keep running in a straight line, and then you're still within the grounds of Churchill. Yeah. Um. So you, you know, it's it's set it's set with this massive, well looked after um lawn, effectively. With, you know, there's own cricket thing right next to the accommodation, um, which you can play you know you can play football, rugby, cricket, croquet, <laughs> ultimate frisbee, whatever your <laughs> favorite sport is. Um, it's it's a nice open college. The because it's slightly newer, the rooms are also you know that much newer, and so they're slightly more practical than some of the rooms at other colleges. Um, yeah. Which which is also nice. Um, it's sort of easy to navigate. Um, they've got I think the largest the largest formal hall of any other college by volume, not necessarily by number of seats, because we've got a very high ceiling. Um, yeah. To make make of that what you will, <laughs> um, but it is it is sort of vast nonetheless. It, I think it sits on like four hundred people at a time, um, and we have you know formals sort of four or five times a week. Um, there's also a very nice bar downstairs. The, the staff are always very friendly. 
I mean, and, the, and the porters were, were always very friendly and supporting as well. And I think that can vary a little bit by college. I think some of the older ones tend to have slightly more strict, uh, slightly more strict style. That said, yeah. co- uh, Churchill, I think, does like to view itself as one of the best colleges. It, it tries to compete at the top. So Trinity has a reputation for driving students much harder than um, some other colleges. Yeah. But I think Churchill also, um, not, not as hard as Trinity, but I think Churchill tried to focus on making sure people made the most of their time there rather than... Academic-wise. Yeah, academically, rather than just um, let them do whatever they wanted to do. Cool. And what, I guess, like, your first time seeing Churchill was when you um, went there for your interview. Um, did you have any, like, I guess, like, first impressions or maybe first impressions when you came at the start of your, like, first year and did they hold up? Yeah, I guess your, your first impression is just, you know, it's, it's sort of just another Cambridge college in a way. It doesn't really matter if it's new or old. It's still just this, I don't, I don't know quite what the word is. It's, it's not necessarily like sacred place, but, it, you know, it's, it sort of feels special, right? There's the whole of the university is steeped in history. You're, you're walking um, in a path where some very smart people have gone before you. There's, um, you know, something like, I don't know, a dozen Nobel laureates associated with Churchill College. Um, I, I think it, it feels the same at all of the colleges, really, um, regardless of which one you go to. Um, yeah. and, and I think it, it lives up to that throughout. They they try and give you sort of the this you know state-of-the-art knowledge, state-of-the-art thinking skills to, to prepare you as best they can for whatever path you choose in life, be that academia or um, business or anything else. Yeah, sounds like Churchill was perfect for you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I certainly really enjoyed it, and it was it's sort of fortunate that it's it was so well placed as well. You know, because I, I looked at the start, you know, was it close to the physics lab? I didn't really look at where it was next to the Cambridge lab, but it turns out the Cambridge lab. Sorry, I didn't really look where it was next to the computer science lab, but it turns out the computer science lab is right next to the physics lab, so I was also right next to the computer science lab. So it was um, it turned out to be, I think, the perfect college. It was, you know, one of the the best places to learn computer science. It was one of the best taught computer science courses. It was right next to the computer science lab. Um, I would not change church, my choice to Churchill College for the world, uh, looking back. Nice. Yeah, and I feel like the that whole um, West, is it West Cambridge site? Yeah, it's getting just built up day after day and it's getting just nicer by the second. I feel like it has the university-wide gym, which is like has such nice facilities. And if you're in a university team, you're likely to train there. So it's... It's good to be ne- next to all of that uh, development. And it I remember it used to have, well, I think maybe it does still have, but it used to have the veterinary uh, training place and it used to have, like, stables with horses that would just graze on the grass in front of all the buildings. So I used to love going through there because I went to the gym um, and seeing all the horses. So that was <laughs> my part. And it's also, no, like, a nice run, I feel like. Did you ever run around the West Cambridge site? Not really. Okay. <laughs> it was a nice run. Take it from me. So we've talked about the college experience. We've talked about your background. And you told us a little bit about the Komsky course as well. Do you mind telling us uh, what people go on to do after studying Komsky and what you're doing now as well, what you did after graduating? Yeah, so you have a choice um, once you finish your undergraduate degree of whether you stay in academia or whether you, what some would call, join the real world. Um, and, and essentially get a job, um, get a source of income. Um, most people tend to leave the world of academia um, and get a job after their undergrad degrees, but some portion obviously stay on. Um, some people do master's degrees, some people do PhDs, some people do that at Cambridge, some people do that at Oxford or some other university entirely. Um, some people go to the US to, to study. Um, most people obviously graduate and get a job. Um, Cambridge and Oxford... Um, and you know Imperial College and, and UCL and those kinds of universities are sort of natural feeder programs for computer science into big tech so Facebook actively hire Google actively hire um, Amazon Microsoft etc um, there's of course then lots of other non-big tech companies you go work for um, most of the time most industry is interested in sort of software engineers not sort of computer scientists um, so you there's a, there's a there's a slight imp- imp- sorry there's a slight impedance mismatch between um, 
sort of what you've necessarily just done in your course and actually being great at a software engineering job because you don't really learn you, know, you learn the basic sort of syntax of a programming language you might even learn how to like build a compiler for one but you don't necessarily learn how to structure big software projects you don't know how to deal with lots of stakeholders telling you different things you don't know how to analyze the domain and work out sort of how, how to do data modeling that much that's that's something you learn more practically um, when you're doing industry experience um, but the, the vast majority of people go into jobs essentially as software engineers at very different places of course some go to um, finance um, or hedge funds or something like that um, I personally stayed in Cambridge for um, another year um, and got a job at a company called Cambridge Consultants. My girlfriend was uh, at Cambridge um, the year below me, so she was doing her final year, um, so I decided to stay in Cambridge to support her rather than move to a different city. So how was your experience staying in Cambridge after having graduated? I assume you obviously like didn't live in college, you lived in your own place and... Yeah, so you, you essentially um, stop being a gowny and you, you become a townie. Um, it's a very different experience being in Cambridge, not being associated with the university compared to being associated with the university. Um, the vast majority of your sort of compatriots, your colleagues, your, sorry, your, the vast majority of your friends at your um, college sort of move off to other cities, uh, largely London. Um, so it is a very different experience in Cambridge. It suddenly feels much, much quieter than sort of so the din that you become accustomed to. Um, and of course, you're sort of getting set into working life and, and the responsibilities that come along with that. Um, it, Cambridge Consultants was a fantastic um, first job out of university. I learned a huge amount there. Um, and, it, and again, you learn a lot more industrial experience that really sort of completes your education in a way. Um, but that said, I, I always had an intention um, once my girlfriend finished her final year to move into London with her as well. So it was always going to be a relatively short-term job. And so what are you doing now? What am I doing now? Um, I work at a fintech startup. Um, I lead a, a team of software engineers um, trying to build a product that changes the way that people um, earn their wages. That's interesting. Do you feel um, the Comsky course and your university experience helped prepare you for that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it gives you a really rigorous theoretical underpinning for all aspects of software engineering. Um, where, where again it sort of lacks is it's, you know, unless you're really solving like a, a sort of an ill-defined problem at a large scale, you know, I say large scale, you know, with, with a team of 10 people, you can't, you can't really replicate that in a university or you can't really replicate doing like a, a 10 engineer or 20 engineer year pro, uh, uh, project um, until you get into the real world and suddenly you're working with a team of 10 people for a year. Um, and so it is different, but it, it certainly prepares you well. And certainly being able to, one of the best things about Cambridge um, is not just the education of the course itself, but you mix with some of the brightest minds of your generation you get to argue with those people, you get to learn how to articulate your point of view and assert yourself and know when to sort of yield and admit that maybe you were probably slightly wrong about that thing. Um, and that prepares you really, really well for, for dealing with you know, a multitude of stakeholders in, in the real world. Do you feel like it was important in your course to get a first or a 2-1? I think it depends. I think if you want to go into um, a hedge fund, then perhaps it is important to really come top of, you know, to top 10%, top decile. Um, a lot of jobs, you know, computer scientists are very fortunate that computer science is so in demand that um, I know people have gotten thirds and gone on to work at big tech. Um, so it's not as important, I think, for computer science right now as it is for other jobs. Now, that might change over time. You know, currently there's this sort of shortage. That won't necessarily always be the case. Um, and I think for, for art subjects, it's, it's still slightly more important. That said, like, as soon as you get a job, you know, it's the same as A-levels. As soon as you get to uni, your A-levels don't really matter. As soon as you get a job, um, I don't think your degree really matters. You know, in 10 years' time, no one's going to look back at whether you got a 2-1 or a 2-2 and, and work out whether or not you're suitable for a, a promotion or a role. Um, but I think taking that initial step into the job market, a lot of jobs do ask for at least a 2-1 minimum, but I think a lot of people, um, you know, weigh that slightly for... To people who come from some of the you know, top 10 institutions. Yeah, I think that's right. I think yeah, some jobs do have s standard requirements, but it 
can be a little bit more flexible when when yeah. they know the the standard of education and how hard students have to work at at Oxbridge. Um, yeah, and I feel like that is just kind of a filter for the really in demand jobs like the classic careers in uh, banking and consulting. But I guess, as Nick was saying, like there is such a demand right now for computer scientists, even though it won't be the case forever. Um, but I guess like it is more open as long as you've got the skills and you can uh, talk about, I guess, like your circumstances. Uh, it's quite, quite open. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the the best things doing one degree gives you is just sort of a a confidence, right? You, you've you've gone and you've competed with some of the best people um, of your generation once again, and you've you've come out looking respectable compared to your peer group. Um, that said, there's I don't think there's any shame if you know through some other circumstance that you don't um, you know come and say the top half of your peer group. Um, lots of people have lots of challenges in life, um, and I think you know tomorrow is another day. There's always another chance to to do better and reinvent yourself. Um, so I, I don't think it matters. That much, but I think certainly it's it's a worthwhile aim to aim for for a two one. I also just wanted to ask when you went to Cambridge. I guess it can be quite intimidating when you're faced with the brightest minds of your generation, as as you said. Um, so how did you deal with that pressure? If you were one of the people who who did feel that pressure, and how did you try to to balance that uh, and balance your studying with um, um, social, social life and yeah, I think I um, certainly felt that pressure initially. Um, initially, you don't really know how smart you are, right? Um, it's it's all relative, and, and until you meet people like that, you don't really know how you shape up relative to them. Um, I certainly felt reasonably well equipped going in, but I I expected to to meet people who are much smarter than myself. Um, you, you sort of naturally feel a bit insecure as a consequence, certainly on your first day. Um, but I think in practice you realise pretty quickly that actually there's not as much variation in intelligence as you might think in, in humans. Um, I think there's a big ver- variation in education between humans. Some some people really receive no education, some people receive you know, a, a really long, really intense, really high quality education. That, that makes a big difference to the way people present themselves. But I don't think intelligence actually varies as much as people think. So actually you, you go and you don't really... Um, see a massive difference in sort of brain power. There are some people who I think think just very differently. Um, certainly mathematics, where you meet some people who can, you know, re- really out, just outgun that maneuver you. Um, those people are pretty special. Um, but it's not, you know, it's it's not as big a step up as you might think. If you've done well in your A-levels, you'll probably fit in, you'll probably be okay. Um, and certainly as, as you settle into university and you finish your first year and you move across, you know, move into second year and you, you establish your own groups, a lot of that sort of falls by the wayside, and you feel like you can actually fit in. But I think I think it's I think it's natural to have a bit of imposter syndrome. You know, it's much talked about nowadays. And I think um, you raised a really important point for for Cambridge and Oxford as a whole to just open access and I guess think about how you can give a chance to people who have not had that high quality education but still show that incredible potential. Yeah, I think um, it's very important to to try and be meritocratic and to try and encourage social mobility. Um, our society would be much worse if it was only the the kids of the wealthy people of the previous generation that, that had the opportunities in this generation. Um, before she came to Oxford, and I, I think all British universities take great strides to try and be as meritocratic as they can, to try and be equitable in um, how they treat people from different backgrounds. Um, so I, I think I think progress continues to be made there. Um, and whilst Cambridge and Oxford were once perceived to be these, these super elite things that only people with um, sort of a network of contacts could get into, now, it, now it's a much more meritocratic process, it's much more transparent. And I, I think um, colleges like Churchill, which have one of the highest state school intakes, are at the forefront of, of that process. Yeah, and I guess you were really lucky in that you got a, a great education from your your school or growing up, but you are first generation uni student. Yeah, me and my sister were the first people in our family to go to uni. Um, we actually graduated one day apart, so I think my sister graduated on the Friday, I graduated on the Saturday from Cambridge, so it was a nice weekend for my parents to come down and see both the kids graduate from Cambridge. Um, but yeah, we're, I guess we're, we're first generation graduates. Um, I, I think it's important not to be put off 
because of your background or because of where you come from. Um, I think what you can achieve is bounded by your ambition. So be ambitious, go for it. The worst thing you can do is get rejected. I did that. It sucks a little bit, but it's not that bad. You get over it. Um, and I, I think it's, it's undoubtedly worth the going. So I guess, is that your tip for just students who are thinking about applying to Oxbridge, is just to, to be ambitious? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it's, it's one of your five choices on your UCAS form. You know, even if you're way off, so what? Just put it down. Um, so many people, so many capable candidates self-select, especially people from disadvantaged backgrounds. They self-select and say, I'm not going to apply because I don't think I'm good enough. And they miss out on a chance to go. Um, you know, don't do that. Don't be afraid of rejection. Don't, um, don't worry about not being good enough. Put yourself up for it. Um, and you never know what might happen. And even if you do face a rejection, you're the standing, living, breathing example that you can be rejected and reapply and get in so it's not like facing a first hurdle can actually stop you from running the whole race yeah absolutely i think there's you know even even if you do you know you have smooth sailing you have a great time at school you get into cambridge first time around you get a first blah blah at some point everyone encounters failure at some point in their lives um everyone finds their first failure tough to deal with um everyone everyone you know a lot of people find most failures tough to deal with but you know it's important to, to dust yourself off pick yourself back up again and, and go again um as ever tomorrow is another day um you can do whatever you want tomorrow yeah i think your story really goes to show that it's not all black and white like you didn't make it the first time that just purely means you're not good enough for cambridge clearly you can have an unlucky day or it's something just... just didn't didn't click that that time but um obviously you were good enough and you did get a first in the end yeah i mean i, I think the, the whole interview and application process it's designed to try and select the people who have the best chance of getting the first that's effectively what they try and optimize for. Um, but in any sort of signal processing, you have this problem of false positives and false negatives. Um, that is, you say no to people who are good enough, and you say yes to people who actually will find it a bit challenging. Um, that That's inevitable. Just because you get a no doesn't mean you're bad. It just means that it was a no on that day. Um, and you just need to, to move on and, and put that behind you and, and use that to your strength. Nick, thank you so much. That was such an inspiring story. And you now seem very successful, very happy with your choices in life. Um, so yeah, it's just an all-round great story. Thanks so much for being here and sharing it with us. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.